Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Princeton Club. My name is Gary Bass. I'm a professor in the Wilson School uh, at Princeton. I'd like to, like to thank everybody for coming out. This is a talk in the New York Toman Lecture Series, which is designed to encourage serious debate about the most pressing issues in uh, public and international affairs. Uh, I'm moderating tonight's session, which is about uh, a topic that I think desperately needs to be talked about more, uh, something that is of enormous importance and is, I think, much too easily forgotten in the rush of day-to-day -day events that this horrible situation continues to go on. We'll be talking about uh, the mass violence, massive displacement that continues to go on to this day in Darfur. There is a new report out by the ICG which reminds us, uh, copies of which are available somewhere. There were ICG people here who uh, were eager to hand these things out. Where's the ICG person? Where were they? Over there. If you want reports, that's the place to go. Um, but this is a, uh, dragging on into almost five years, something that has cost uh, some 200,000 lives, more than 2 million people living in camps, and somewhat fewer deaths in 2003, 2004, but it's still a situation where conditions in the camps are, uh, are horrifying. These are incubators of radicalism and misery. Uh, some of the camps actually have still been attacked, and there is now this huge amount of debate about the deployment of a hybrid UN-African Union force into Darfur. We're very privileged to have with us tonight two of the people who have worked the hardest to try and resolve this situation. Uh, first, we have the UN Special Envoy for Darfur, Jan Eliasson. He is a veteran diplomat who served as Foreign Minister of Sweden, as well as Ambassador to the United States from Sweden and Swedish Ambassador to the UN. At the UN, he was also the first UN Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and has also been President of the General Assembly, Vice President of the Economic and Social Council, and the Secretary General's representative on Iran-Iraq, among many other jobs. He's also authored and co-authored numerous books and articles, a frequent lecturer on foreign policy and diplomacy, so we're very glad to have him with us tonight. Also, uh, next up, we have Ken Roth, who since 1993 has been the executive director of Human Rights Watch, one of the world's best respected human rights groups. Before coming to Human Rights Watch, Ken was a federal prosecutor for the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York, right here and also a prosecutor on the Iran-Contra investigation. He's conducted human rights investigations around the world in many of the 70 countries that Human Rights Watch monitors and tracks. Uh, and he writes often for places like the New York Times, the New York Review of Books, and Foreign Affairs. So what we're going to do is have uh, our, sp our panelists speak for about 10 minutes apiece. Uh, I'm going to say a few things, and then relatively quickly we'll try and get the floor opened up to questions. So with that, uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'm now going to turn the podium over to Jan Eliasson. Thanks. Thank you very much, Gary, and uh, very good to meet you. And uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, you made me feel very old. Did I do all that? You didn't uh, um, do the mistake that a lady made, and now my colleagues will recognize my... I told the story this morning, but it, it happened when I left New York uh, as President of the General Assembly that I was invited to a function. And in my CV, it says that I have a long experience. I, I didn't write it, but a long experience in the conflict resolution and mediation. And I came to this uh, gathering, and I didn't quite recognize the group. The men with beards, long beards, and uh, women with dreamy eyes. I didn't mind that at all, but still. I didn't quite recognize my usual foreign policy crowd, but then I looked at the invitation in front of me. It says, Mr. Eliasson is an expert in conflict resolution and meditation. <laughs> so, same speech. I, I'll, I'll take you on a helicopter ride for three minutes uh, to introduce the subject, uh, and uh, I think it gives you the some of the main elements of the situation in Darfur. Uh, Salim Salim, my co-negotiator in the African Union, and I left Khartoum uh, for one of the trips, end of May or beginning of June, I think. It was the dry season, <coughs> and we uh, flew from Khartoum to uh, El Fasher, the capital of North Darfur, 
and we switched to helicopter and flew by helicopter to Umrai, a village in the north of Darfur, where we were supposed to meet some of the SLA, the Sunnis Liber SLM, as Sunnis Liberation Movement representatives, under the tree somewhere in north Darfur. <clears throat> we flew 400 meters above the ground, and you see a lot of good, you, it's very good from a helicopter, that glass bubble, you see uh, the realities on the ground. So the first thing we saw was three camps from the uh, air. Uh, one, I think, had 30,000 people in the camps, another one 45, and the third one possibly up to 60,000. Uh, you see, the, see them from the air, and you know, see, you see the, uh, the uh, white roofs and the uh, blue roofs of the UNHCR and UNICEF and so forth. And I had seen those camps on the ground, uh, unemployed or loitering men and not going out on the... In the fields, uh, women uh, worried about going out uh, to uh, fetch uh, wood for fire uh, out of fear of rape. And, of course, kids uh, or youth, rather, young people who had been there for three or four years and uh, where I really felt the frustration and anger uh, meeting them when I was there. And I would say this is a ticking bomb. Uh, we uh, have seen, of course, the, the absolutely horrible... Uh, events of 2003, 2004 primarily, but the, today's reality is very much the um, frustration and anger of, in the camps. Two million people out of six living in camps under these conditions. Those of you who have dealt with the Middle East know what can happen when you spend a long time in camps. Second thing you saw from that helicopter was uh, strange things. Black squares. <laughs> Black squares. <clears throat> and I asked myself, what is this? But it was actually the... Uh, remaining walls uh, charred from the fire, and no roofs. So you saw or ceilings, roofs. So you saw it from the air, just a lot of black squares, deserted villages, the places where the people in the camps had lived. And uh, most of these uh, villages that we passed had no inhabitants. They were empty. But there were a few where they were moving in. I understand from friends uh, in uh, Darfur, that many of them are now being reoccupied. So here's the second ticking bomb, the reoccupation of land. And these are the realities of Darfur today, the frustration and anger in the camps and the land that is taken over by people who don't own it, and I saw it from the air. The third thing I saw from the air I never believed I would see, namely desertification. It was a windy day, and the sand took over the, uh, the grass. <coughs> And uh, I asked the helicopter pilots when we landed, and they said that during the time they had flown there for about three years, they thought that the desert had gained 8 to 10 kilometers per year. I can't vouch for that figure, but it says a lot about the desertification problem and the fight over grass, the, the uh, element of, of economic uh, distribution of resources. Oh, well, finally we landed, as you understand, otherwise I wouldn't have been here. And uh, we saw the movement leaders. We spent three hours under the tree, and uh, they convinced, they, t they told us that there was no military solution, uh, which we announced publicly afterwards. And that was one of our efforts to bring the movements together. So that is very much the situation. Uh, the uh, hopeless life in the camps and the ticking bomb in the uh, form of uh, reoccupied land. Uh, and, uh, of course, the fact that we need to get the movements to, um, to bring uh, themselves together and come to a coordinated position to the talks. We have spent uh, almost 10 months, Salim and I, to bring them to the negotiation table. Uh, we had a good uh, sequence of events leading up to a meeting in Arusha in Tanzania where we got most of the movements to come, except Abdul Wahid, who sits in Paris, by the way, pretty comfortably, I must say. And um, at that meeting, they, uh, in fact, uh, uh, formulated a common uh, platform for the talks. That was a very important step forward. That in combination with the UN Security Council Resolution 1769, which was adopted on the 31st of July, were really uh, very positive news this summer. And was the basis for the Secretary General's decision early September to invite the parties to talks in Sirte, Libya, on uh, the 27th of October. I must admit that it was a little bit of a gamble because uh, we knew that things were not 
getting going well at the time of August, September and October. We had a deterioration of the security situation on the ground. The humanitarian situation was very, very fragile. We also had a growing split inside the movements. The second big movement is GEM, Justice and Equality Movement. They split into two or rather three factions. And we also had growing difficulties inside the government of Sudan. The government of national unity was under strain. The SPLM, the Party of the South, had grave difficulties on the CPA implementation, the North-South Agreement. And those uh, frictions came out in the open during August and September. And uh, all this, of course, was a negative development as related to the positive development early August when we had the Arusha meeting and the Security Council Resolution 1769. We still came to the conclusion uh, that we should start the talks. I was on hard talk the other day, a slightly masochistic exercise, uh, and I, I said then that, uh, yes, we didn't start in the glory that I would have hoped, namely all of the movements coming in and applauding the political process and staying in Sirte and working. No, we didn't. But we started a political process. Sometimes you have to start a political process. I've dealt with mediation for 26 years or so, and sometimes you simply have to go for it. You have to start a process. And I say that if we hadn't started the process, this deterioration of the situation might have led to even greater difficulties. I think the fact that we started the talks now has intensified the work among the movements to unify their positions. They, are, they were split into, uh, it depends on how you count, anywhere between 10 and 18 movements, depending on how you define the movements. Now I think there is big hope that we may have three movements uh, three, mo three, three groupings coming out of the present uh, discussions going on in Juba in the south and in Darfur. And that, in turn, will facilitate our work to bring them to the table uh, with a coordinated position and also decide on negotiation teams. But I can tell you, when you ask uh, movements to uh, define their positions uh, uh, on uh, facing the negotiation, is one thing. But when you ask them then to, de to decide on a negotiation team, it's a difficult thing. Different thing, because then the, the, you will bring back the old leadership issues. So uh, this is the uh, situation we face now. I'm reporting to the Security Council tomorrow with Jean Marigiano, who is joining me here tonight, who is, has the masochistic task of dealing with the peacekeeping <laughs> operation. You might have to, a few words about that. <laughs> we have to sort of measure uh, who is most, most masochistic right now. Uh, and then uh, we, I will go back to, to to Darfur to see the movements again and uh, make sure that they realize that this is the opportunity to move to the uh, talks. Uh, and then we hope to start the substantive negotiations as soon as possible. For me, it's very important that this uh, political process is irreversible. Once you start this process, you have to make sure that the political track is being pursued. And this goes for both the government and the movements. The movements have their task of uh, defining their common positions and their negotiation team. The government of Sudan has a grave, has a very important task ahead, namely to show that they are a government of national unity because the SPLM of the South and the Bini Minavi, who belongs to the government, as you know, who had signed the DPA in 2006, have not accepted fully to be part of the government delegation to the talks. And this is serious because that brings in the CPA dish issue. And I see, look at Francis Deng, the north-south issue. And the question is whether we can deal with the Darfur issue in isolation or not. I would hope that would be the case, but uh, everything in, in uh, Sudan is interrelated. And uh, this will add to the many difficulties we will have. But I think this would, could serve as an introduction to the subject. Uh, it's a very, very difficult task. It's one of the most difficult that I have taken on, I must admit. But uh, we have at least the beginning of the political process. Uh, if that can now proceed in parallel with the beginning of the peacekeeping operation, then the, both, the two should be mutually reinforcing. And I would hope also that uh, the, the longing for peace of the people of Darfur uh, will be uh, given expressions. I must say, when you deal with the movements uh, that it is very healthy to remind them of the uh, voices of the civil society. We have been trying, Salim and I, to bring in the, the civil society into the peace process. We had 12 great representatives in Sirte, which 
was not noted so much in the world press, which really were the words and the voices of peace and the longing for peace and the people of Darfur. Uh, we will try in the substantive part of the talks to make sure that we have the voices of the civil society in the discussions on, for instance, issues like land, compensation, uh, humanitarian issues where their voices need to be heard. Uh, if we don't have that voice heard, then I think we run the risk of not having credibility for the process. And this is made extremely difficult because the only person that speaks out very actively against the talks is a person by the name of Abdul Wahid, who has a very strong voice in the camps. And strangely enough, uh, this message to the camps that this process is not worth starting has uh, unfortunately received, uh, has, has some, some uh, understanding when it is being broadcast. That's why we, we have to also think of a, a, pub, a uh, public information strategy and make sure that the, uh, we reach out to the people of Darfur, and that is very much through civil society. So, uh, Gary, I leave you at this, and then uh, I suppose you want to have Ken come up, and then we will take uh, questions uh, and comments from the floor. Thank you. Well, I have to say, it, it's, it's a bit frustrating being here talking still about Darfur, um, in that um, you know, we're going on five years, and at least four years where people knew where Darfur was. Um, and, and we still, in many ways, are having the same conversation. Um, now, you know, first, you know, what is happening in Darfur, I probably don't need to spend much time on that. I mean, as Gary and, and Jan mentioned, you know, there are, are two million plus people in the camps. Um, the killing is down from the height, but life in the camps is precarious. Um, Kalma camp outside of Niala, the government is threatening to go in and disarm um, the, the 90 some thousand residents there, um, which would be a, a very ugly process if it actually took place. Um, there is, um, because of the splintering of the rebel groups and because the, the Janjaweed and the, the various proxy forces for the Sudanese military continue um, to, to exact um, violence uh, against um, people they encounter. You still have you know, a wide degree of lawlessness, including periodic killings, regular rape. Um, and um, you know, aid workers are being attacked. In many ways, it's sort of the chaos of the region is mounting as the number of groups um, proliferate. But you know, I can't say that that has been radically different from what we faced a year ago or two years ago. And, and the frustration comes from um, you know, how, how difficult it has been to do something about this. Um, in many ways, you could think of Darfur as a casualty of the Bush administration's decision to invade Iraq, because had it not been for that, we might well have been talking about a military intervention. It at least would not have been completely off the table. But given um, the, the fact that the U.S. And, and, and much of its allies, certainly Britain, were preoccupied with Iraq and, and Afghanistan, um, the military option was never really on the table, um, you know, leave, let alone whether it would even have been wise for um, Western forces to try to intervene without consent in as remote an area as Darfur. So the, the solution has depended on the consent of the Sudanese government. And, and the difficulty all along has been how do you um, coerce that consent, if, if you, um, you know, want to use an non sequitur there. Um, the, the broad outlines of the solution, I think, also have been pretty clear. Um, it requires, you know, I think, broadly speaking, four steps. Um, you know, one, which is, is in Jan's you know, um, meditation department, if you will, um, is, um, you know, is, is the idea of actually getting a peace, you know, getting the, 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 the factions to, to agree at some level to stop fighting. Um, but the other three parts do all travel via um, Khartoum, and even the, the peace negotiations to a large degree do. Um, and that is um, there's a need for, for the Sudanese government to rein in um, its militia to, to you know, stop authorizing the killing and rape of people and, and to begin to impose some kind of discipline on those who continue. Um, second, there's a need to um, deploy um, a substantial peacekeeping force, significantly more than the 7,000 African Union forces who have been in place up until now, and, and that's Mr. Kahano's um, task. Um, and, and then third is the need for some kind of justice, some kind of accountability, some kind of reestablishment of the rule of law. Um, and that has been the task of, of the International Criminal Court. Now, um, let me, if I could, just run through briefly and um, a bit more concretely what is involved in this and then what I think might be done to ratchet up the pressure on Khartoum to make some of these things um, more possible. The, the area where we seem to be making the most progress is in the realm of peacekeeping. Um, and, and there, at least since the summer, has been um, consent on the part of Khartoum to the deployment of, of another 20,000 peacekeepers. 
Um, and that, you know, is a, a, a very important step forward, one that I think is to a large degree the product of, of delayed Chinese pressure. Um, we can get to that in a moment. But um, it is one that still remains at the theoretical level because the, the devil is in the details. And, and um, Mr. Kahano, if he wants to, I'm sure can teach, talk about this in much more detail than I can. But suffice it to say that um, Khartoum still is insisting largely on, a, um, on an African force, which, um, as I understand it, is not so much a problem when it comes to supplying the foot soldiers, but becomes much more of a problem when it comes to the, the various specialized tasks that are needed to make a peacekeeping force like this um, effective. And so, for example, um, one of the big questions is, where do you get the helicopters? Because um, you know, if, you, if you go into um, to Jan's helicopter ride over Darfur, you know, one of the things he neglected to mention is that there are very few roads down there. And so you know, if the peacekeepers get a, um, you know, a, a radio message that the Janjaweed are attacking Camp X, how are they going to get there? Um, you know, they need helicopters. And, and the plan is to deploy 18 helicopters for um, deployment, you know, transport and, and attack purposes. But who is going to supply them? Um, there is no um, African force that has that capability. And so in and of itself, you've got to get past Khartoum's um, resistance to having non-African troops there. Um, plus, you know, there, there's a long list of, of governments that you know, have been talked about recently. The one that I think is probably most likely is Italy, but you know, others on the table have included Spain, Greece, the Czech Republic, Belgium, Poland, Russia, China, India, and Turkey, um, none of whom have yet said yes. Um, and of course, none of whom have yet have the, um, have the permission of, of Khartoum to deploy. Um, we may hear more about that later, but this, this remains a, a huge problem. Um, there also is the need for, um, for armored personnel carrier, for heavy transport, for the, you know, the various kinds of things that you need for a peacekeeping force to deploy safely in a context where there really isn't peace to keep, where, where they are playing at least somewhat of an enforcement role. So um, you know, getting the right troops on the ground is going to be a big task. Um, so far, um, apart from African troops, Sudan has said that it would let in Chinese troops, and indeed the, the first Chinese engineers have already deployed. You probably saw in the paper um, that the GEM, one of the rebel groups, is now threatening to attack the Chinese, um, which, you know, on the one hand, you can understand their frustration because China does seem to be the, the principal funder of the, of the war effort. But on the other hand, um, you know, this is somewhat counterproductive since, um, you know, we do want these forces deployed as, as quickly as possible. Um, the um, other... Thailand has offered um, 800 infantry troops. Um, so far as I understand it, Khartoum has said no. Nepal has offered special forces. So far the answer is no. Um, Pakistan, um, India may be acceptable, but there is, there's still a lot of work to be done to get beyond just the, you know, the, the, the foot soldiers, the combat troops, and put together a viable force that is capable not just of watching, not just of reporting, but actually of protecting people. And that is, of course, the mandate that, that um, everybody expects will, will be the case. Now, um, there is um, so, th so that let me let me you know leave it to that um, for the moment with respect to peacekeeping. Um, we will be looking at things like mandate. You know, to, there we will be looking at sort of the composition of the force in the sense that one of the real problems that the African Union force faced was that since the Darfur peace agreement of Abuja, there had been um, representatives of both the government and the rebels um, sort of within each deployment of, of the Amos force. And this has tended to discredit these people in the eyes of, of those who they're trying to protect. And so one of the real challenges is will, will be, you know, how does the peacekeeping force under UN auspices or the so-called hybrid force, the UNAU force, how does that demonstrate its independence sufficiently from the government in particular that it will have credibility among the people that it needs to protect? But um, these are sort of details which we can get into in conversation. The second point I wanted to highlight was um, the role of, of, of justice or accountability. Because it, it's one thing to, you know, sort of to clamp down and to, to impose some kind of military um, protective force. Um, it's another thing to build the rule of law to make clear that this kind of mass killing, these kind of atrocities, cannot continue to be committed with impunity. And here the Security Council did the right thing. Indeed, um, you know, somewhat to our surprise, the Bush administration was, um, uh, was able to um, be convinced to abstain on the Security Council vote referring Darfur to the International Criminal Court. This was, um, I think, the great victory of the Christian right in this country um, because the Bush administration faced a choice between you know, disappointing its base 
and, and um, succumbing to this institution that it viewed as a threat to you know, America's ability to project its military power. And, and in that context, um, it was willing to go with the base. And so you know, it, it, that was the beginning of, of the end of its efforts to destroy the International Criminal Court. And it, today it has you know, evolved into much more of a modus operandi with, uh, or modus vivendi with the ICC. But the ICC, frankly, has been a bit of a disappointment. Um, it has so far indicted two people. Um, one, um, Ahmed Haroun, who um, most recently was, I think, the humanitarian minister. Um, the, um, the Sudanese government, in a way of sort of you know, thumbing its nose is that the international community had the audacity to name Haroun as the um, co-chair of a commission that was going to investigate um, conditions facing people, particularly in the North-South conflict. But you know, to show that this is not a war criminal, he's a respected humanitarian, um, they did this, I believe, just as Ban Ki-moon was, um, was, was visiting um, Khartoum. So it was clearly sort of a, a thumbing its nose at, um, at the UN in particular. Um, another individual, um, is, it was a Janja weed leader. But um, that is it. And it has been a long time since the ICC has had jurisdiction over Darfur. Um, I have spoken with um, Luis Moreno Ocampo, the ICC prosecutor, about you know, why this is all we have. And his view, his strategy, is that the ball is in the Security Council's court. You know, I don't need to do anything more. I've indicted two people. Now it's up to the Security Council to force the Sudanese government to, um, to surrender them. Sudan is not cooperating. It's not living up to its Security Council obligation. You know, all of that is true, but it frankly strikes me as, as a very formalistic approach to his job, and one that I think is not terribly politically savvy. Because if you look, for example, at other tribunals that have, had faced, have faced similar problems of an uncooperative target government, um, take, for example, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, um, there the, the series of prosecutors from Goldstone to Arbor to, um, to um, Carlo Del Ponte have recognized that you know, a, a series of indictments keeps the issue in, 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 the, in you know, the public's mind. It demonstrates that this is not just you know, a couple of bad apples, but that this is a criminal regime. And look at all these people. You know, 70 people, I think, have been indicted by the, the Yugoslav tribunal. And, and this you know, series of indictments has not had the effect of putting the pressure on the prosecutor to, um, to you know, kind of carry things forward. It rather has heightened pressure, in that case, on, on Belgrade to gradually surrender people. And while you know, Mladic and Krasnodar still are at large, a large number of indictees have been surrendered. And I, you know, I've said this to Reno Campo, he doesn't buy it, but I think it is a mistake for him to, um, to simply you know, sit back passively while the, um, the Security Council is supposed to do its job. He could make it harder for the Security Council not to do its job were he to continue with these indictments because there are plenty of people to indict. Um, and and it, is, you know, it is not hard to come up with that evidence. So you, the, the justice route, which is clearly one element of the solution here, has not been going anywhere as well as those of us who had pushed for it initially hoped. Um, I should note, though, and this maybe comes more into Jan's um, domain, there are other kinds of accountability that it will also be important um, for the, the negotiators in search to address. And these are ones that are not really dependent on the ICC. Um, you know, one was mentioned already, which is just the basic issue of land title, since there are now many, um, you know, mostly Arabs, um, coming in and taking over these villages from which um, the, the local tribes have been chased. And there are big questions as to who owns this land, who ultimately has title to it. So even were it to become safe for people to go home, they would suddenly find that there is no home to go to. So that um, working out land title and some kind of fair system um, for, for re regaining one's land will be a critical part of any long-term peace process. So will compensation, because frankly, some people won't go home. They'll be too afraid to go home. They won't be able to go home. And finding some method to compensate those who have lost everything um, will be a, a key part of, of, I think, any peace that is likely to be acceptable broadly to the people of Darfur. Um, there also is going to mean a need for vetting. Um, some kind of, um, you know, part of the solution inevitably will be an incorporation of the various forces into some kind of, um, you know, governmental military force. Um, and there is going to be a need to vet out the people who have been responsible for mass atrocities. And I say this with respect to really all sides. Um, you know, certainly um, governmental troops, Janjaweed, but also the rebels. 
and, and in incorporating that kind of vetting process is going to be a very important form of accountability where we have precedence in other situations. Um, but it's, it's essential that I think the CERT or whatever you know, going forward is the peace process includes. Um, finally, um, and, and this is no trivial matter, it is essential that there not be an amnesty. Um, it is one thing to you know, recognize that you may not be able to um, prosecute people immediately, and certainly you won't be able to prosecute everybody ever. But it is important not to close the door on the possibility of prosecution, you know, to, to indicate that, that you know, these issues, the, these crimes are ones that, that at least pose a certain minimal risk to anyone who committed them. You know, realistically, it will be at best the, the senior commanders and that's it. But this is um, something that, that is certainly part of the guidelines that the UN has adopted for all of its mediators. But it is one that I think is, is, is particularly important here that, that we remain true to. Um, final point, let me just say that the, um, because so much um, will be accomplished only with the agreement of the Sudanese government, there is a real need for continued pressure on it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I think the most effective form of pressure has so far come, you know, not from the New York Times ads and not from, you know, sort of the, the popular movement, but rather from the Chinese government. And, and the fact that, um, you know, on the one hand, it feels particularly vulnerable because its Olympics are coming up and, and it doesn't want to sort of, you know, spoil its coming out party. Um, but, but also, you know, frankly, it doesn't want to be seen as the supporter of thugs and murderers around the world. You know, it doesn't want to be seen as, as you know, purchasing it, it, its oil at the expense of the blood of the people of Darfur. And, and there is, you know, there is a whole generation in China that does aspire to be a responsible global citizen. And what was happening in, in, in Darfur was, was the biggest scar possible on, on the, the reputation to which China aspired to. And here I do think that the, the, the mass movement, the, the, you know, the broad popular attention to Darfur and the increasing linkages with China over the last couple of years is what led um, early initially just a year ago, led the, the UN ambassador, Chinese ambassador to the UN um, to play a constructive role in Addis at that point on negotiations over the, um, the, the um, sort of the next stage in the peacekeeping process at that point. Um, so I think that it is, it's critical for that to continue. Um, it is not as if, you know, China's done all that needs to be done. There's going to be a need for sustained pressure and, and you know, linkage to the Olympics is, is perfectly fair game. The other part in terms of the West that I think can be, uh, more could be done on, and this is something that I know the Bush administration has toyed with but has not gone nearly as far as it should, is the idea of using banking sanctions to pressure um, Khartoum. And I won't get into the, a lot of detail here, but suffice it to say that the Treasury Department has the capacity to prevent any bank from clearing dollar transactions through a U.S. bank if it continues to um, provide services to anybody it names. And so it could name, you know, the top Sudanese officials and say that any bank that, that services these people loses its access, in essence, to the dollar market. And no bank is going to risk this. Um, this, you know, by the way, is what the Bush administration did to get North Korea back to the negotiating table around the nukes. And it was one, you know, obscure little bank in Macau that did the trick. Um, so this is a very powerful tool that um, the administration is now toying with, I think, most actively with respect to the Burmese junta. But it's one that could be deployed, I think, effectively in Darfur, particularly if um, the Sudanese government starts to slow things down through the kind of, you know, um, vetting and the like of, of um, potential peacekeeping um, contributors. So let me um, stop there and, and welcome the conversation. Okay, I'm going to talk very, very quickly, uh, and then then we'll open it up to Q&A. I want to say something very quickly uh, about China, which I think, as Ken said correctly, is a crucial part of this, uh, of the puzzle, that they're in the position to exert the maximum leverage over Khartoum. They, in recent days, have been somewhat better than they have been in the past. So I think this is, uh, in some ways, where a lot of the a lot of the most important diplomacy really goes on. Uh, I spent some time in Beijing over the summer interviewing Chinese officials, uh, people in the foreign ministry, some other, some other bits uh, about, about Darfur. And they were, first and foremost, they are enormously surprised to be talking about this at all, that they, this sort of obscure part, why is this ruining our coming, our 
coming out party? Why is it that the Western world has decided that this is, you know, in all of the crises all over God's creation, why is it that this is the one thing that gets attention? Uh, one foreign ministry official said that this was the first time that the human rights pressure that China is coming under is mostly about Chinese foreign policy. It's not about human rights pressure for China's own domestic human rights record, but suddenly it's about what, how China conducts its foreign relations. Uh, the biggest step forward that China has taken was that they joined a unanimous UN Security Council in voting for 1769 on July 31st, 2007, authorizing this hybrid uh, UN peacekeeping, UNAU peacekeeping mission for Darfur. A year previous, almost exactly a year previous, in August 2006, China dragged its heels, said we need consent from uh, from Khartoum. And then we spent uh, – then Sudan dragged its heels, not so surprisingly, on that consent until June, so almost another year lost, in part thanks to Chinese diplomacy. China – the other thing that China has done is committed 275 combat engineers, which is sort of like the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, uh, to help uh, to help uh, get things ready for the uh, UNAU mission. But I think despite these moves, which are very helpful, uh, there's also been some pressure placed on – on Khartoum to accept, to give its consent to this mission, despite these moves which are helpful, which are important. Uh, the fundamentals of this relationship between China and Sudan are strong. First of all, the Chinese government does not, does not want to get into the habit of bailing out on its friends. Sudan exports two-thirds of its oil to China. Uh, the Chinese foreign ministry brags that China is Sudan's most important trading partner. This actually, in some ways, is a brag that I think they shouldn't be making because it emphasizes, well, if you know, two-thirds of their oil goes to you, doesn't that give you a lot of power? Uh, so they may be a little bit off on that. Uh, the state-owned oil companies are – have an enormous amount of clout in Beijing, uh, and they push the foreign ministry very hard. There are warm relationships between the Chinese Communist Party and the ruling party in Khartoum. And China is also, as a matter of principle, very serious about the support of national sovereignty. Uh, and when it's talked about in the Sudanese context, when they, when, when they hear about this bit of the country that thinks it might eventually split off, then they think about splitists in their term in Taiwan, in Xinjiang, in Tibet, and it's something that makes them deeply uncomfortable. Now, the one thing that I did not find in China uh, was any particular sense uh, while I did find some embarrassed foreign ministry officials who said, we know, we know this is killing us, we look terrible, we gotta, we've got to kind of clean up the image a little. But I didn't find anybody who thought uh, terrible, unusually terrible things are happening in Darfur. And this is something that sort of shocks the conscience of the world and demands that we do something. Then in fact what you get is somewhat the opposite, is that Chinese officials are so used to being – uh, slapped around by human rights groups, and they always feel that it's biased and unfair that when – or by, uh, by the New York Times or by the Washington Post – that when they get hit this time, they think, here you go again. So I talked to, to one foreign ministry official who was describing how a, another Chinese official went, went off in a Sudanese government trip to Darfur. Uh, where the, and the Sudanese government, surprise, surprise, showed their Chinese guests around and they took them to refugee camps. And this Chinese official then came back and gave a PowerPoint. The Chinese foreign ministry is now on power, PowerPoint. Gave a PowerPoint presentation to, uh, to you know, foreign ministry colleagues saying, look at these, you know, these refugee camps. They're not so bad. These IDP camps, they're not so bad. They're quite well organized. I didn't see any Janjaweed. Um, and you do, you know, I said, well, don't you think this might have been a little bit staged managed? I mean, you are the Chinese government. If you were doing this, wouldn't you stage manage it? Um, but they're, they're so convinced that – they're so used to the idea that the international community unfairly gives them a hard time on human rights issues that I think it really hasn't <laughs> – it really hasn't sunk in. China has signed and ratified the Genocide Convention, which does make it harder for them to back away. That they do, you know, they do feel it's much easier to raise things there when it's something that the Chinese government has already consented to. But they got a little bit left off the hook by a UN report from 2005 that said that it wasn't that it didn't quite count as genocide. The UN actually did say that the bloodshed may be no less serious and heinous than genocide and that some Sudanese leaders did ha act with genocidal intent, but that's something that kind of gets washed out. What you get from the Chinese is that they'll say it's not genocide. They'll do the same sort of 
of, of rhetorical dance that the Clinton administration did about Rwanda, not genocide. Well, there might be acts of genocide, but it's not really genocide. And that, that en enables them to duck uh, the genocide convention. So I think the bottom line is that you do see a little bit of progress, which is impressive. Uh, but the danger is that this will be the, equi the equivalent, the foreign policy equivalent of what the Chinese government sometimes does, which is will will you know spring a dissident or two when uh, when there's a summit coming up or when Human Rights Watch has a couple too many reports, they'll just sort of get you know get rid of someone in a slightly cosmetic way. And I think it's important that they not be let off the hook quite so easily. And this is not just because. Uh, you know, because I think it's a good thing or because Ken Roth and Jan Eliasson think it's a good thing. But ultimately, I think it's something that's going to serve this kind of policy of excessive chumminess with some very, very unpleasant regimes is something that is going to serve uh, Beijing long term very, very poorly in much the same way I think that it served the United States government poorly. That when you develop these warm relationships, not with societies, but with authoritarian governments who treat their people very, very badly, then one of these days these people will get to express their opinion of the Chinese government. And you can imagine two generations from now that there are going to be a lot of people in Burma, in Zimbabwe, uh, and in Sudan, who, when they think of China, think of it not as a responsible power, not as a dynamic power, but they will regard it with loathing. I think that's the trap that the United States has fallen into in many places. It would be great if China could not make some of our mistakes. I will now, uh, with that, uh, turn it over to the good part, which is Q&A. So if people could identify yourselves. We have Steve Barnes at the back. We have people at the back with mics. So if you can just put a hand up and somebody <coughs> will 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 come and come and get you. Uh, say who you are, and then questions. Great. Thank you. Questions in the sense of questions rather than speeches. A couple of them, yeah. a couple of them at one time. Huh? Thank yeah. you. Let's My say. name is uh, Rahama Dafalla. Uh, I'm from Darfur, from a small village called Muzbet in North Darfur. My question to Mr. Uh, Yan is, what's your criteria to identify the movement? Because I myself from Darfur, I feel like a lot of people just they splitting from main stream groups and like two people they they making themselves they are like movement and they've been invited in negotiations and they have table over there so that's kind of motivating them to more splits so uh, my question is that what is your criteria? to identify the movement, because anybody have a one Soraya phone and one vehicle considered to be movement, or there is yeah. a specific criteria and some kind of a capacities to consider as a movement. Other question is, what are the consequences for those movement who refuse to join the peace process? Uh, is there, if they are continuing to not participating, what are the consequences? Thank you. Gary asked me to respond immediately to this, and um, uh, let me tell you that um, when we started the talks, we would very much have liked the movements to have identified their negotiation teams. They hadn't reached that stage uh, when we wanted to start the talks. And we therefore chose a so-called inclusive approach. We wanted to invite all the movements uh, who could have an influence on the situation on the ground, not least uh, on the issue of cessation of hostilities, which was supposed to be our first item on the agenda. And we intentionally uh, phrased our invitation to the opening session of the talks. Uh, we left it open for the movements to continue their preparations during the month of November, three or four weeks or so, to finalize their work on the preparations for the substantive talks. So our invitation to the first uh, first, uh, uh, first session was, first of all, to reflect that we didn't want to choose who were the representative of, uh, of uh, Darfur, and secondly, we want to have as effective a cessation hostilities agreement as possible. But we are now hoping that they will finalize their own consultations, hopefully around three groupings that we will then meet with and hope that they will come up with a team to the negotiations. Uh, this was uh, to the first issue. On the other issue, those who do not attend the talks. I would make a clear distinction between those movements that need 
as they say to us, more time to prepare their positions, and perhaps also to those who are not very happy to have competing personalities in the negotiations at the side. But they also confirm to us that they want to take part of the political process. They want to find a, a political solution. With these groups, uh, we are in close contact. Our chief mediators in uh, Sudan are traveling to Juba and Darfur and talking to them. We have great, great hopes that they will come into the talks and by that hopefully create a critical mass of participation in the next stage. The other group is, are those who completely reject the political process and who even instigate and propagate that they should, the, the IDPs, the international, internal displaced persons, should not take place, or set up preconditions which more or less make the negotiations uh, unnecessary. Because if those preconditions are fulfilled, you may not even need a negotiation. That's a different category. And uh, I, it's up to the Security Council to decide what to do, but I, I hope that they will also come to the conclusion that this process is there to serve the people of Darfur and change the conditions for the people of Darfur. Great. Can we, over here. I'm Elizabeth Lindenmayer. I'm the acting director of the UN study program at Columbia University, SIPA. Uh, and I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit, I mean, ask a question about the tool of peacemaking now and the conflict resolution. Because we are in a situation where obviously there are divisions in the Security Council. Uh, Sudan is aware of it. Um, we uh, also know that we need Sudan. And no matter how we look at it, we need their consent, particularly for the deployment of UNAMID. So my question to you is really, how do you see this tool of carrot and sticks? Because Kenneth Ross was talking about ICC and was saying that you know ICC has been disappointing and is not active enough. At the same time, we know that it has been accused of preventing peace. Um, so my question to you is really, how much pressure can you put on a government that you whose consent you need for everything. I know it's a difficult question, but if you could comment on this, both of you, thank you. Dan, you want to start? Well, I mean, let me make a couple of points. I mean, first of all, I, I think it's important that um, the, the protection track proceed distinctly from the mediation track. Um, there, you know, there is one point of view that, you know, what you really need is peace here. And so let's not do anything that might upset the peace talks. And um, you know, I understand that logic, but and much as I you know, wish Jan you know, success tomorrow, I'm not banking on that. And, and a lot of people can die you know, while, while Jan is doing his work. And so I think you need a, you know, you need a parallel process. The, so then the question is, you know, since we do need to operate with Khartoum's consent, we're not going to invade. Um, how do you get that? And, and I, I do think you know, that this is where coerced consent comes into it, and we have to you know, make it costly for Khartoum not to consent. Now, I, was, um, I have to say that the Human Rights Watch, we started working on the International Criminal Court after I had taken a trip to Darfur and then went to, um, to Khartoum. And I was, um, I was struck how well the government officials I was meeting with knew the Rome Statute. Um, and, and, you know, I, I know this pretty well. I mean, I was in Rome. I was you know, very involved in that. These guys knew it as well as I did. And, and at a time when it seemed as if the Bush administration was going to veto any Security Council effort to refer the ICC, and otherwise there was no jurisdiction because Sudan had never ratified the treaty. So you had to start saying, well, why are these guys so worried? And, and it, it, you know, they were worried about a possibility, but they were really worried about a possibility. And, and um, you know, there's a tendency, I think, from afar to, to think of Sudanese leaders as being, you know, just a bunch of, you know, low, low life thugs. You know, because after all, who would commit mass murder like this? But when you meet with them, these are, you know, refined, cultured individuals who don't want to spend their dying days dodging arrest warrants in the Sudanese desert. You know, they want to be able to do their Paris shopping trips. They want to send their kids to Oxford and Cambridge. You know, they, they, they want a normal life. And the ICC is an impediment, a potential impediment to that. And I think that it is, um, as a result, a, a critical and a very personalized form of pressure. Um, now, you know, so far, 
Moreno Campo has, has aimed at a pretty modest level. I mean, the people he's indicted are mid-level at most. But, but the, the threat of higher indictments, I do think, is part of why the killing is down. I mean, there are a number of reasons, but I think it, it has been one of the impediments to further mass slaughter. Because once this became a, a possibility, and once you know, it was clear that if they did continue at the rate that was going on in 03 and 04, that this was going to just invite Moreno Campo to go after them at the highest levels, I think they thought twice about this. Now, you know, does this make it a little bit harder to get the peacekeepers deployed? Absolutely, because they're worried that the peacekeepers are going to be, a, you know, really a hidden arrest force. Um, but it is, you know, I think that is something that we're going to have to live with. But it is, I, I think, a critical part of why we've gotten as far as we have, particularly in, um, you know, in this diminishment of the killing that we've experienced in recent years. Well, I, I can only add that, <clears throat> of course, uh, we don't want to see any contradiction between the uh, ICC process and the, uh, the peace talks. I mean, they have to be conducted in parallel. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last thing I would do, would like to see is that we, we who are responsible for the peace process, would it try to quiet down the, the uh, efforts to, to reach justice. So. I talked to Ocampo today about his report and what he aims to do, and I think it's very important that the government of Sudan delivers uh, on, the, uh, on the requests of the ICC, uh, and that this also affects the whole climate. Right now, we have a lot of attentions on the movements because they haven't been able to coordinate their positions, but we must, of course, continue to also to have uh, requests, have, have demands on the, on the government of Sudan. Uh, on the peacekeeping side, we have major problems right now. Uh, and uh, even in our cooperation with the civil society, we run into problems with the government of Sudan, of them allowing, not allowing the uh, civil society to take part in our process. And uh, on the humanitarian operations, we have problems of access. So we, we will definitely uh, have uh, demands on both sides. Um, the uh, issue of, uh, of peacekeeping, I think, uh, I, I would like to ask uh, Jean-Marie later on to give his comments on the, on the peacekeeping side, the, the need for consent to, for, for troops. Uh, it's a factor of life for security, very important, but of course it's also important to maintain the, uh, the authority of the United Nations. So this is a very difficult balance to strike right now. We, you are, and Mr. Millet, you are right in the midst of such discussions right now, where you have to strike a balance between that right of sovereignty, and on the other hand, to maintain the, the authority of the United Nations. You know that very well, Elizabeth, from your earlier life. Great. Um, in the back there, Steve, can you? Thanks, Steve. Uh, Jeff Laurenti, Woodrow Wilson, MPA 74, Century Foundation. Hi, Jan. A couple quick and interrelated questions. International Crisis Group's new report. Sorry, we're, can we make it one? We're running low on time, and I want to get as many people. Uh, yeah, right. Sorry, right. sorry to do that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> sorry to do that. Um, what is the degree of Arab world, Muslim world solidarity behind Khartoum? What is the degree of pressure that that large community of nations uh, may be able to mobilize? Is there any sign that there's any influence in that direction? And very quickly, uh, when you talk about consent, once a UN force is in, do folks still think that under the Utant rule they have to go the day the government in Khartoum decides it doesn't like something that the force has done and says leave? Or would it more likely find a way with Security Council mandate to stay longer until, uh, until the situation is resolved? Um, well, um, the uh, Arab solidarity uh, is not that much of a uh, factor in the uh, Sudan situation. Of course, it's obvious that some of the Arab uh, states have uh, perhaps stronger relationship to the uh, government of Khartoum than they have to the uh, movements in Darfur. But still, I would say that that is not uh, the key factor. The what 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 is a dilemma? What is going to be a difficulty in our talks is that. We need to connect to the uh, to the Arab com the Arab population of Darfur. They they uh, probably represent about thirty percent of the population, and I think you all can imagine that these thirty percent are not all Janjaweed. 
How do we connect with the with the rest of the Arab groups that are bona fide and who want to be part of creating uh, the new Darfur? Uh, without uh, alienating the movements who would think that by that we would invite people who are connected indirectly or directly to the Janjaweed. Uh, we try to get the Arab component into the talks through civil society and possibly through one of these three groupings that I mentioned in the beginning, which also uh, com is composed of Arab, uh, Arab movements. I'm not sure that's enough, but we, 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 we run into great difficulties on this issue because uh, the government very often, uh, or some of the parts of the government, thinks that they represent the Arab component. And uh, as I said, the movements react to uh, people who are indirectly connected to Janjaweed being part of the talks. But I think to leave out 20, 30 percent of the population of Darfur would be a big problem. That is my, one of my headaches, the second, or Salim's headaches. The other one is the IDPs, the internal displaced priests. I can't ref refrain from saying that, because if they don't, if they are not, if their voices are not heard, the voices are not heard in the talks, uh, we will be in a weaker position. And that brings back the Abdul Wahid problem that I mentioned earlier. Um, we just we just have time for one last comment, but I'm going to give it to Jean Marie Guineau, who's the head of DPKO, the UN Department of Peacekeeping Operations. So Jean Marie. Thank you. Well, uh, the question was asked on consent and uh, what that means for the uh, for the peacekeeping uh, <coughs> for the for the peacekeeping operation. Actually, strategic consent of uh, of the Ghana Sudan is of the essence. Uh, the, if you are in a country, if you deploy a military force in a country without its consent, it's called an invasion, uh, and it's a different type of uh, of operation. Uh, peacekeeping presumes assumes that uh, the various parties think that it is in their best interest to have uh, a third party military force. That is, the, that is the assumption. That doesn't mean that at all times they are pleased with every action of that force, uh, but they have to accept, to, to, to believe, not to accept, to be convinced uh, that their strategic interest lies with having that force. And so, Consent, it's not a technicality, and so we can discuss the composition of the force, the statute of forces agreement, uh, whether we can put helicopters in that airport or not, uh, or not whether there is the, I mean, the civil aviation authority. And there's a, Sudan is a functioning state, uh, which has uh, regulations ranging from civil administration to, import, uh, to uh, importation of goods, I mean, a range of issues. If Sudan doesn't think that the force, the deployment of a peacekeeping force is, if the Ghana of Sudan doesn't think that the deployment of a force is, it, is in its interest, mm -hmm. it has every mean at every, every uh, moment to stop that force from deploying or to prevent that force from operating once it is deployed. Uh, that, is, that is the basic uh, fact of life. I think one... Uh, one of you asked, uh, but once the force is, uh, is deployed, uh, then if the governor of Sudan uh, says it's not happy with the force, I mean, what does the force do? Well, the force is in deep trouble. Uh, that's, the, uh, that's the reality. Uh, the, the force can operate only if it's, it has at all times that strategic consent. Otherwise, it's, it's a different exercise from peacekeeping. It requires different forces. And uh, I don't see where the con the, that this is being uh, contemplated. Uh, so the reality is that until the calculation of the government of Sudan is that its fundamental strategic interest is in having an effective, credible force in Darfur, I think that is that uh, strategic shift that needs to happen. Uh, and uh, that is, I think, what we all have to, to work for because, I mean, the risk of a continued situation is the kind of fragmentation that uh, makes uh, Jan Eliasson's efforts so difficult in, uh, in Darfur, where uh, movement uh, fragment in sub-movements and sub-factions, and where ev eventually nobody is really in control of the situation, uh, neither the, the government nor, nor the rebel movements. That's, that would be a very dangerous situation mm -hmm. that does not uh, strengthen the uh, sovereignty uh, of the government over its, its territory. So I think 
an argument can be made that it is the uh, long-term strategic interest of uh, the government of Sudan to have a, an effective peacekeeping force uh, in Sudan. Uh, but we, if that conviction is not with the government of Sudan, I think uh, the, it's an illusion to think that a force can uh, make a, a, real, a real difference. And in a way, the, the problems that are being encountered in the uh, deployment of the force parallel the problems that are encountered in the negotiation. I mean, it, it, the negotiation requires strong engagement from all actors, uh, readiness to make concessions, uh, including on the part of the government of uh, Sudan, uh, and likewise uh, with, with the force. And the, the declarations that we heard from uh, the GEM, in a way, parallel the uh, what... Uh, we have heard from the government of Sudan on some of the uh, troop uh, components. Uh, it means that the expectations of the parties are, in a way, fundamentally different vis-à-vis -vis the force. And of course, they would never be identical, but there has to be some common ground on what the various uh, players on the ground expect from the force. If there is no such common ground, it's very difficult to see how a force can make a, a real difference. Okay. So we're going to have two qu very, very quick closing comments from yeah. Ken Roth and Jan Elias. And Ken. So Ken and then Jan, or Jan and then Ken, which way do we? Ken. Yeah. I mean, I, um, I guess maybe just let me add to, to Jean-Marie Hino's comments, which is to say that, um, you know, as a UN official, he's absolutely right to talk about the need for um, consent by all sides. Um, and it's not his job to, to generate the pressure that makes that consent possible. That's, that's the job of many of us. But um, it's, you know, con consent is not a, um, you know, it's not something that just sort of happens on its own. It's not simply a matter of, um, you know, governments suddenly seeing the light. You know, consent is a product of the, of the options available. And, and our job is, is really to make the alternatives to consent sufficiently unpalatable to the Sudanese government that, that it welcomes some of the steps that are needed here. Because... You know, what, what's needed is, is not simply, you know, as I think we all know, the classic, um, you know, blue helmet interpos interposing a force between two parties that have accepted a peace. What is needed here is a tough enforcement um, force. And Sudan doesn't want that. And, and it is, you know, that is where the resistance is coming. I mean, it's, 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 not, it's not stupid to say they only want African forces. They realize that only African forces means what they have now, you know, which is not really an enforcement capacity. And so the task before us is to make it sufficiently painful for the Sudanese government to continue blocking these critical steps that are needed to go from simply, you know, kind of an African Union style watching and, and, and being there to um, the hybrid force, which, you know, is contemplated to be able to actually stop the killing. And, and we shouldn't stop putting pressure um, on Khartoum via, via China, via Europe, via the United States until that, that broader, more difficult consent is obtained. Well, I, I will s simply make a comment on, on the basis of uh, my question to myself. Uh, why is the Darfur conflict so difficult to solve? And uh, I, I think it goes back to uh, the fact that you, you have to have a positive move on so many fronts at the same time. You need to have the... Uh, cooperation inside the Security Council, in, in the international community, uh, in a way which definitely was not the case 2003, 2004. I think we have growingly uh, positive trends. 1769 was a sign of that. Uh, your remarks about China uh, were relevant, but there is, uh, I think, uh, a uh, uh, closing of positions, uh, more cooperation in the Security Council. Uh, 2007 than it was 2003 to 2004. I hope that trend will continue. But um, there has to be really uh, a will on in the international community to contribute to this process. Uh, in the peacekeeping side, uh, there, there are deficiencies uh, in terms of that uh, solidarity. And um, the positive trend in the Security Council has to also be, uh, be met with contributions in very material sense now, not least in the peacekeeping side. On the political side, I feel that I have strong support from the international community. And that's fine. The second circle where things have to be go, go right is the neighborhood. 
If you look around the world, you have Balkans, you have the whole Horn of Africa. This is an area where you really have to have a close cooperation of the countries in the region. Because the colonial borders of, uh, which were drawn in uh, Berlin 1885 do not correspond to the ethnic realities of, uh, of Sudan and Darfur, definitely. You know, the president of uh, Chad is a Zagawa, who belongs to the second most important African tribe of, uh, of Darfur. And we have intentionally now, Salim and I, uh, worked with the four regional uh, actors to make them part of the process. They are partners in the work that we are now conducting with the, in the political process. We had a meeting in Asmara, uh, 14th of November. We're going to have another meeting next uh, week in uh, Sharm el-Sheikh with the four regional partners, Egypt, Eritrea, Chad, and Libya. Then you have to have, thirdly, the... Um, cooperation of the government of Sudan. It's been fine. They have said, fine, there is no military solution. Uh, we want to, we, the DPA, the, the Darfur Peace Agreement is not take it or leave it. We can uh, live with changes, but you know, no renegotiation, but fine. They gave us diplomatic space. But recently we have had growing problems. The, the, the situation has become dif more difficult for us. Realistically, we are, we are facing greater obstacles than we did in August because of the lack of cohesion inside the government of Sudan with the SPLM the, and the uh, National Congress Party, and also the problems of cohesion among the movements, although there are some positive trends. And that is the last, the fourth point is, of course, the cohesion and the cooperation of the movements. So if you have these four circles, you have to have the right constellation in all of them. The national community, regional powers, government of Sudan, and the movements. And the, the tragedy is that during this period of the last four and a half years, there's either been one or the other of these circles where things haven't been in the positive sense. And now we have a mixture of positive, small positive things, growing regional cooperation, better cooperation versus between China and the U.S. and the Security Council, but growing problems in terms of contributions to the efforts from all of the, of the international community right now, and dissension inside the government of Sudan, which weakens the, the process and the where the, uh, the Darfur issue becomes an issue also in the relationship between the two parties of government, SPLM and the National Congress Party. And then the movements, we hope that they will go in the direction of cohesion. In that case, we will try to bring them together to prepare the ground for the talks and then move into the talks. But it's uh, enormously difficult, and um, we need to have uh, work on all these four levels uh, to make progress. And uh, I think it's great that you are interested in the subject to this degree, and I thank you for inviting us. Thank you.